In this lesson, we're starting with the graph and drawing some conclusions from it and maybe supporting those conclusions algebraically. So we're starting with what I hope would be an easy example for you, looking at a graph and trying to find particular data about that real world situation in the graph. So in this graph, they are representing a real world situation um, the value of a stock with this polynomial function. Uh, you see it represented as v of d is 0 0.002 times d to the fourth power, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and d represents the day of the assessment and v is the value of the stock. So what you're being asked in part A of this problem is to use the graph to estimate the value of the stock on the 10th day. So we look at our graph and we find the 10th day. So the 10th day is about here. And where that x value of 10 is crossing our graph, it looks like it's approximately 32, 33. So we would say approximately maybe $32. So that's our estimate. And then it wants us to confirm our estimate algebraically. Well, if D is 10, then when I plug in 10 for D, I would get something close to $32. If I'm confirming my estimate, if my estimate is completely wrong, then I'm going to be nowhere near $32. So what you're going to do in your calculator now is to find the V of 10, and that means plugging into your calculator all of this loveliness, 0 0.002 times 10 to the fourth power minus 0 0.11 times D. Times 10 to the third power plus 1.77 times 10 squared minus, whoops, too many times. eight point six times 10 plus 31. So all of that is what you're typing into your calculator. And if you have the TI-84+, plus, then you can type that whole thing in and see it as it's typed in to make sure that there's no error in what you typed in. If you're using a scientific calculator, you just kind of have to trust that the calculator is using order of operations properly. Okay, so 0 0.002 times 10 to the fourth minus 0.11 times 10 to the third. Let's try that again. My calculator misunderstood me. Plus 1.77 times 10 squared minus 8.6 times 10 plus 31 and it's $32 right on the money. Take a moment and work through the your turn below. It's still referring to the same graph as the last problem. We're using the graph of a relation or a function to determine its domain and range. So once again, remember what domain is. Domain is what kind of x's am I allowed to input? What kind of x's exist in my graph? And in these functions, they're not actually giving us the equation, so we can't make any decisions about what x is allowed to be 
as far as what I've discussed in a previous lesson, like taking the square root of the negative number, dividing by zero. That's not necessarily what we're thinking in these problems. We're just looking at what kind of x's are in my graph and what kind of y's are in my graph. Um, it doesn't tell us whether to use interval notation or set notation. So you could probably get away with using either one depending on which one expresses your answer more clearly. All right, so let's look at domain for part A. So for part A, what I would like you to notice is that if I go any further left on my graph than negative 2, there's nothing else happening. So my domain starts at negative 2. So I'm going to use this in interval notation. And since that is a closed circle at that negative 2, I'm going to put the bracket there. So bracket, negative 2, and I scan my graph and I go looking to the right, looking to the right, looking to the right, and then I get to 6, and after 6, nothing's happening. So 6 is a boundary of my domain, but again, make sure that you're paying attention to whether it's a bracket or a parenthesis. Because at 6, there is an open circle, that means I have a parenthesis there. For my range, if I'm looking at my graph from bottom to top, I see that nothing is happening until I hit 0. And then going up my graph, I see that after 4, I have no more values in my range. And since there doesn't appear to be a open circle at the 4, I'm going to put a bracket there. So my domain is from negative 2 to 6, with negative 2 being included and 6 being excluded. And my range is from 0 to 4 inclusive. For part B, let's look at it pretty much the same way. So I look at my graph from left to right. And I see that things start to happen at negative 4. But at negative 4, I do not have a value for y. It's an open circle, so that's why I'm putting a parenthesis there. And going to the right, I see that there's something happening at 2. It's jumping. My graph is jumping down to something else. And at that 2, there's an open circle in both parts. So I'm going to close that with a parenthesis. Union, because at 2, it starts again, and it goes to positive infinity. And again, remember that since infinity isn't an actual value, we use a parenthesis for that. My range, looking at my graph from bottom to top, to top, I see that it goes from negative infinity to negative 2. And then once again, I have to take into account that there's this gap here that picks back up at 6. And that's my domain and range for those problems. In this problem, we're being asked to use the graph, again, to analyze it and estimate where the y-intercept will be. And this is one of the things that we'll do very frequently in this class, is to use the graph of a function to kind of give us some expectation of what we will find algebraically. So here's our y-axis. And remember that a y-intercept is just the point on the y-axis where the graph crosses the y-axis. So it looks like it's crossing it right here at 0, 4. And then it's asking us to find the y-intercept algebraically. 
Remember, the y-intercept will always, always, always have an x-coordinate of 0. So in order to find the y-intercept, all you're doing is plugging in 0 for x. In a function like this, this is a very easy calculation. This becomes 0 when I plug in 0 for x. This becomes 0 when I plug in 0 for x. This becomes 0 when I plug in 0 for x. And all I've got left to do is add 4 which makes sense that y would equal 4 when x equals 0, which is exactly what we found there. Take a moment to work through the your turn below. In your text, before this example shows up, it talks about what a 0 is, what a root is. Um, they're saying the same thing. Zeros and roots of an equation of a graph are the x-intercepts. Um, when we're talking about the root of an equation, what we're talking about is what does x equal in order for the whole equation to equal zero. So you could think of them as the solutions for the equation. So in this problem, we can think of it as trying to find our x-intercepts. And again, notice what they're asking us to do. They're asking us to look at the graph to approximate the zeros, so to get a general idea of where our answers should end up when we do this algebraically. And then we'll do it algebraically. Okay, so in part A, I have 3x to the third minus 10x squared plus 8x. And in my graph, again, I'm looking for where it's crossing the x-axis. It looks like it's heading at 0, maybe 1.75 and 2. Okay, so those are my approximate zeros. And then I'm going to go through the process of actually solving this thing. All right, so if I have that 0 equals 3x to the third minus 10x squared plus 8x, the first thing that I would hope that you'd realize is that this polynomial has a greatest common factor of x. So let's factor that x out. That'll leave me with x times 3x squared minus 10x plus 8. Now I have a quadratic. And a couple of lessons ago, we talked about how to factor a quadratic. This quadratic um, does factor because I'd be looking at 3 and 8 multiplying together to get 24. And does 24 have factors? that have a sum of 10, yes, they are 6 and 4. So I have x. I know there's only one way I'm going to get that 3x squared, and it's with a 3x and an x. I know the 3x has to multiply by something to either get 6 or 4. I know I'm not going to multiply 3x by a nice pretty number and get 4, so it must be 6. 3x times 2 is what's going to give me that 6 which means this must be 4, so that when I multiply it by x, I get the 4x I'm looking for. The signs in my parentheses are the same because of that last sign in the trinomial being positive. And when they are the same, I look at the sign of my middle term, and it's negative. And when I set each of these factors equal to 0, I can figure out my values for x. So x equals 0 or 4 thirds. Or 2. So 4 thirds is equivalent to 1.3 repeating. So this one, I was a little bit off. But 0 and 2 were accurate. Um, but at least the 1.75 approximation 
is between one and two, and that four thirds that I found algebraically is also between one and two. So my approximation is somewhat supported by my algebra. In part B, similar idea. We're looking at the graph to identify the zeros. And they don't look like they have any numbers on that. So we're going to assume that each box is 1. And I'm going to say that that 0 looks like it's at approximately negative, mm, negative 0.2, let's say. So that's my approximation. And now I'm going to solve this algebraically. So that means I'm solving for 0 to equal the square root of 4t plus 1. So in order to solve this equation, I need to get rid of that radical. I square both sides and get that 0 is 4t plus 1. I subtract the 1 and divide the 4, and t is... is negative one-fourth. So my approximation was really stinking close. Negative one-fourth is equivalent to negative 0.25. My approximation was negative 0.2. So my algebra supports my estimation. 